I am proud to introduce to you up next, right now, is Scott Harrison. Scott Harrison is the founder and CEO of Charity Water, a nonprofit organization on a mission to end the global water crisis. His work is important, the impact widespread, but his story is what's most inspirational. I'm sure you'll be moved when you hear it. Please help me welcome Scott Harrison. Hi, Scott. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations on, uh, on the success. I can't believe, uh, wow, close to 200,000 people registered for this. Um, well, I'm, I'm excited to share my story. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in. I've prepared about 70 photos and I think we'll, uh, I'm looking forward to having a conversation. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity. Let me uh, jump into this real quick. Okay, so uh, thanks for allowing me again to share the story. Uh, my name is Scott Harrison. I was born in Philadelphia into a middle-class family. Uh, that was my, my dad and my mom. And uh, I was a good kid growing up, uh, taking care of a mom who was unfortunately very sick. Uh, there, was a, there was an accident in our house, but I was that good kid that played piano every Sunday in church and, and listened to his parents. Uh, unfortunately, at 18 years old, I moved to New York City and and I became a nightclub promoter. And I spent the next 10 years chasing all of the wrong things, uh, filling up nightclubs full of, of people, getting them drunk every night, uh, chasing the fashion scene around the world. And I, I wanted to have the perfect car. I wanted to have the perfect watch. Uh, I wanted to, to be seen with all of the right people. And over a period of 10 years, I, I kind of destroyed my life. Uh, this was a picture of me 10 years later, where you can see uh, I am showing off a pretty stupid Rolex watch that I thought was important at the time to a nightclub uh, photographer who I'd never even met. Uh, over 10 years, I picked up a lot of bad habits from smoking to gambling to drinking to drugs. Uh, this would be a picture uh, of me, you know, sometime late morning after, after a night of degenerate hedonist partying. And at 28 years old, I realized I'd come so far from the, the Christian spiritual roots I'd been brought up with. I'd come so far from uh, the morality that my parents had brought me up. And I, I made a change, a radical change. I sold everything that I owned. And I said, I want to go in and volunteer and see if my life could be of service to someone else. But I sold all my possessions and I, I joined a humanitarian mission in a country called Liberia, West Africa. And I was going to be joining a group of doctors and, and United Nations peacekeepers going into a country where a brutal 14-year civil war had just ended. Uh, I was living on a hospital ship, a 522-foot hospital ship uh, with 42 beds filled with the best doctors and surgeons who had given up their vacation time to operate for free on people who had no medical uh, care, no access to medical care. Um, I found the country of Liberia to be a disaster. There was no electricity in the country. There was no running water. People were living in bombed out apartment buildings or, or houses uh, that had once been beautiful but had been ruined after this 14 year civil war. We would look for sick people that we'd hope to help. And our doctors specialized in facial tumors, in flesh eating disease, and in children who were born with cleft lips and cleft palates. At the time, there was one doctor for every 50,000 people in the country. And the people that would respond to these flyers uh, blew my mind. The third day I was in Africa, I took this picture of over 5,000 sick people who came to stand in the parking lot of a football stadium, of a soccer stadium, in the hope of seeing our doctors and getting treated on the ship. The first child that I met that day was a, a boy named Alfred. And he was 14 years old and he was suffocating to death on his face because of a benign, a benign tumor that had been growing. His mom had pulled out this photo and said, at 10 years old, four years ago, my, my son was completely fine. But four years later, this tumor has taken over his mouth and I'm afraid he's gonna suffocate to death. There's no doctor to take him to, there's no surgeon. And that's why we were there. That's why these doctors had given up their time. And a couple of days later, I got to document this amazing eight hour surgery as a doctor from the UK and Germany removed Alfred's tumor. A couple of weeks later, I got to take him home 
with his new face uh, to his village. And I got to watch this little boy heal. I got to watch his life restored. And it moved me in such a powerful way. It couldn't have been more different than the previous 10 years of running around nightclubs, chasing cars and watches and, and getting drunk. Uh, that year, I, I took 50,000 photographs embedded with this organization as their humanitarian photojournalist. And I met so many extraordinary people that I didn't know what was next. I just wanted to keep doing it. So my second tour, I went back to Liberia for another year. And when I went back, I realized that the dirty water people were drinking in the villages of West Africa, it was making them sick. And as I traveled through the, the rural remote areas, I saw people drinking out of swamps and out of ponds and out of rivers. I met a 13 year old girl named Hawa. And I realized this was the only water she had ever known her entire life. I learned two things. I learned 50% of the country was drinking bad water. And I learned 50% of the disease in the country was caused by unsafe water and a lack of sanitation. And boy, that just hit me so hard. And the, the chief medical officer of the ship said, Scott, if you really cared about global health, you would use your life to bring clean water to people in need. You could play doctor to millions, maybe even tens of millions of people just by providing this most basic need for life and for health. So I said, okay. I came back to New York City at 30 years old. Uh, I was broke because I had given all of my money at the time to Mercy Ships, the organization and the people that I met. But I, I was very passionate about this life's mission. I was going to work to bring clean water to everyone on the planet. And uh, it's a big problem uh, as, as, we, as we sit here logged on all around the world. Unfortunately, 785 million people don't have clean water, especially now in this time of COVID, a tenth of the planet doesn't have the ability to protect themselves against the spread of the virus, to the, the clean water, the, the, the water to wash their hands. Uh, it's just inaccessible for 785 million people. And over the last uh, decade since starting Charity Water, I've traveled to 69 countries and I've seen what it looks like to be trapped in the water crisis. I meet kids like John Bosco in Rwanda and I learned that this is the only water he's known his entire life. He uses this water that you see for drinking, for bathing, uh, to wash his clothes. Uh, I met this girl in, in Honduras and, and she was drinking from uh, a, a muddy river that ran in front of her shack. I learned that up to 50% of the disease in the world uh, is directly related to, to clean water. There are 24 different diseases that we can track directly to unsafe water. Some you've heard of, like E. coli, uh, maybe cholera. Others maybe you haven't heard of, like schistosomiasis. Well, that's just a terrible word for, for parasites or worms attacking the body, attacking the immune system. I learned that one out of every three schools on the planet not only didn't have clean water for its students, but it also didn't have toilets. And this was one of the top reasons why teenage girls were dropping out around the world, unable to go to a school a few days a month when, when there was no water, when there was no toilet. And I learned this, this powerful link between the lack of access to clean water and education. I learned that it deeply affected young girls and women. And culturally, whether I was in Southeast Asia or India or East Africa or West Africa, it was always the women who were out there digging in the sand, looking for water for their families or, or braving crocodiles as they ventured into muddy rivers like this one in Eastern Kenya. I also learned that it's a completely solvable problem and that's what's so great about clean water. We know right now how to bring clean water to every single person on the planet. Now there's no silver bullet, there's no one size fits all solution, but a lot of things work in a lot of different contexts. Sometimes we can drill a well and find the clean groundwater. Sometimes we can build pipe systems or harvest the rain. I'll share just one example in Cambodia where the bio sand filter is the appropriate solution for villagers there. Uh, there's surface water everywhere, but it's dirty. It looks contaminated. Imagine drinking water like this. Imagine giving water like this to your children. 
And what we do there is we provide the money and the, the training to work with the locals to construct these bio sand filters. Think of it as almost a giant Brita filter that goes in the house. And the women contribute $10 themselves. They make it over a period of days. And then you pour the dirty water into the top of these filters and you get clean water out, removing 99.5% of all the contaminants. It's an extraordinary uh, technology. Water like this becomes water like that. And when you're able to bring clean and safe drinking water into a community, uh, when you're able to provide that for a family or for children, it has a transformative effect. When kids drink clean water, they are healthier. They spend less time with diarrhea or dysentery. Uh, children aren't going blind with trachoma when they have clean water. Uh, when you bring clean water into schools, the education improves and more teenage girls are able to go back to those schools to get an education, to become the future leaders of their community, of their country. It gives women lost time back, women that were often walking six or seven hours a day to a faraway swamp or pond or river are now able to use that extra time to start small businesses, to, to sell bricks or to rice at the market, earn an extra income for their family. Many women tell me they're just able to spend more time with their children, leading their families forward. One of the best things about working with clean water is that everybody, regardless of race, regardless of religion, regardless of where someone might stand politically or, or on social issues, everyone can agree on clean water for humans. No one watching wants that child to drink dirty water and risk her life. And it's a terribly unifying issue. It's an issue that brings people from all walks of life together. I started Charity Water 13 years ago to address the global water crisis. And uh, at the time, uh, the mission was clear, bring clean water to everyone on earth. But I was 30 and I was talking to everyday people and I realized so many people simply didn't trust charities. There was a huge cynicism. There was a skepticism when it came to giving money to charity. I learned 42% of Americans actually say they don't trust charities. 70% of Americans said they believed charities wasted their money. And I wondered, what if there was a better way? What if there was a new business model, a way to restore that lost faith in charities, to restore trust? So I had three big ideas. The first was, could I create a way where 100% of all donations to Charity Water would go directly to build water projects and help people in need? To do that, I opened up two separate bank accounts and made a promise that uh, the bank accounts would not meet, that, that all of the money for overhead would be raised separately from a group of small donors. We then decided to only work with local partners so that, so that you know, we wouldn't send a guy like me from, from New York over to India or Southeast Asia to drill a well. We would find and identify the locals in each of these countries. We launched ad campaigns then to, to raise awareness. Uh, we, we believed if we could get people to think differently about the water they use every day, maybe they would join the movement. Maybe they would give to help other moms not potentially give their kids death in a baby bottle. This turned out to be true when we got ads uh, on, on buses donated, on taxi tops, on television. People wanted to spread the charity water message. They wanted to help. We launched campaigns like this, just shooting wealthy people uh, in the same situations as the people we were hoping to serve around the world. Imagine if your kids had to go to school in uniform carrying dirty water. We would never allow it. We, we took to social media. We became the first charity to reach 1 million Twitter followers. We were the first charity to use Instagram. And we believed that the, the movements of the future would be built online, connecting people of all walks of life. And, it would be our job to celebrate the extraordinary things our community was doing to raise awareness and to raise money for clean water. We then stumbled upon this, this idea where we asked people to donate their birthday for clean water. And we said, you have enough stuff. Most people don't need more gifts. You might not need a new handbag or a tie or a wallet when a tenth of the world, 785 million people don't even have clean water. So we said, donate your birthday and 100% of whatever you raise will go directly 
to the cause. And we had these amazing stories. A seven-year-old in Texas started knocking on doors, saying, my name is Max. I'm turning seven, and I'd like $7 for my birthday for charity water. Max raised over $22,000, enough to help a couple communities get clean water. Jack Dorsey, who created Twitter and Square, donated three birthdays, raising almost $200,000. This idea spread to Hollywood. Will and Jada Smith donated their birthdays, raising $219,000. And they actually came with me to Ethiopia to see the people that their birthdays, that their community had helped. All that was cool, but the heart of the movement was 16-year-olds in like Maggie Moran, giving up her sweet 16, raising $5,000, or, or 89-year-olds like Nona Ween. And I love uh, Nona's mission statement that she wrote on her website. She said, I'm turning 89, and I would like to make that possible for more people in Africa. She had been born into privilege. She, she had health care her whole life. She had clean water. And she wanted her 89th birthday to make it possible for others to have the chance to live that long. There was a remarkable story. A, a nine-year-old girl in Seattle, Washington, had heard the Charity Water story, and she donated her birthday, and she only raised $220. And in fact, it was a little short of her goal of raising $300. But she said, I'll try harder next year. And, and, and you know, she was happy she at least had raised something. And unfortunately, right after her birthday, she was killed in a terrible car crash. And the news of this nine-year-old girl who gave up her birthday gift so that other children could have clean water started spreading. And it spread through her church and faith community. It spread through the Seattle community. It spread through the country. It spread to Europe and down into Africa and throughout Asia. And people all over started donating $9 in her honor to create a legacy for her. She wound up raising more than $1.3 million from that initial campaign of 220. She wound up inspiring over $2 million of birthday campaigns from strangers she'd never met, eventually helping well over 100,000 people get clean water to drink. And we realized that this was what Charity Water was all about. It, was, it wasn't our story. It was the story of Rachel and Max and Nona and Maggie. It was the story of our community. And if we would continue to invite people in to care about the issue, to bring what they had, uh, we, could, we could help a lot of people. We focused on being radically transparent. And as we scaled our work across 28 countries, we wanted to know that when we built a water project, we knew that it was built because we were capturing satellite images and GPS coordinates of every project. We were proving them on Google Earth and Google Maps. But we wanted to know that they would continue working over time. And we worked with, with Google uh, to create a sensor, effectively making a smart well where we could connect some of the most rural villages to the cloud and that these wells would self-report their functionality. And if they broke, technicians would be dispatched to keep clean water flowing. So now, as we move forward, we're able to share with our donors not just a satellite image or information or costs about an actual project they funded, but we can show them how much water is flowing day in and day out on the projects that have sensors. It's a lot has happened in 13 years, and we've been fortunate that the movement has grown to over a million people supporting Charity Water from 140 countries. Those donors have now given almost half a billion dollars to the cause, and it's allowed us to scale the organization very quickly, thanks to the generosity of others. We've helped 11 million people get clean water. All that money has turned into the impact that transformed 11 million lives. And that's across 28 countries. And today, Charity Water employs over 1,400 locals who are taking the donations in there, leading their communities. They're leading their countries forward. This guy's gone, thankfully. This guy does not get invited to speak to you today. And since I've changed my life uh, 15 years ago, I've been on a very different path. And I've been blessed with an amazing wife uh, that I got to work with at Charity Water for almost a decade. Uh, that's my son, Jackson, who's about to turn six. My daughter, Emma, who was born on my birthday, who's about to turn four. And I've really never looked back. It has been such an amazing way to, to, to live life in the service of others. Uh, last year, I got the opportunity to write about that 13-year experience. And I wrote a book called Thirst, 
I donated all of the advance and all of the future proceeds to Charity Water. I wanted the book to, to not only spread the word, but also directly help people get clean water. And uh, it turned out debuting on the New York Times bestseller list. And, and on day one, I, I couldn't believe it, but the book was endorsed by, by people I respected, people like Bill Gates or Michael Bloomberg or Richard Branson came out in support of this book and came out in support of Charity Water. Um, a final thought, you know, we've, we've helped 11 million people, but 785 million people need it. So we've done about 170th of the work that needs to be done. And I think of, of all the things that I've heard around the world, I mean, people called us crazy in the beginning. The 100% model would never work. You know, who does some club promoter, some club rat think he is, thinking he's going to raise money uh, and make any sort of impact? And, and yet our team just pressed forward with this belief that, that we could do it, that, that it was possible, that the impossible was, was possible. And someone sent me uh, th this last image that I'm going to share with you, uh, passing a bodega in New York City about a decade ago. And it's, it's really been my, my life's quote. It's this thought. It says, do not be afraid of work that has no end. And it comes from a, an ancient rabbinic text. Do not be afraid of work that has no end. And I, I really believe that if you are positioning your life or your, your work or your money, your assets, and you're asking, how can I be useful to others? How can I put my time, my talent, my money in the service of others? Well, then it is a never-ending work. There is no finish line. When we reach this moment when everyone on earth has clean and safe water to drink, you know, we're not just going to drop the mic and try to be greedy with our money. We would take everything that we've learned and we would focus our community, everything we've learned, all of those resources on another pressing need, maybe hunger, maybe a justice issue, maybe a, a health issue. But I, th this, 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 used to this used to terrify me, this idea that, that there's just no end and, and now it's, it's just kind of become a, a life's mantra. So uh, with that, uh, we'll jump back into conversation. If you'd like any more information about Charity Water, uh, you can just go to charitywater.org, uh, or if you're interested in anything more about the book, it's thirstbook.com. And thanks for letting me, uh, me share some of the images. I'm going to stop my screen and, uh, and jump back into conversation. Hi, Scott. Uh, thank you so much. And it doesn't matter how many times I've watched the Charity Water story. Uh, every single time impacts me just as if I'm watching it for the very first time. Um, you know, but it's actually really incredible to hear that even though you're doing something like charity and even something so transparent, like just trying to something simple, give people clean water, uh, but yet you are facing a lot of rejection um, when you started oh. and probably still do today, I imagine. Um, and, you know, similar to WSB, uh, many people also you know, reject financial education, whether through skepticism or previous experiences. So I just want to ask uh, for our viewers out there, you know, how many or how did you over, how did you overcome that? How did you get your team to overcome those rejections? Um, what keeps you staying optimistic and remembering about your vision on helping people? Yeah, I know you, you have hugely ambitious goals uh, that, that are, are scary goals um, as, as we did and, and we do to this day. Um, I think it's focused on those few yeses. Uh, you know, I wrote in the book, you know, the, in the early days of Charity Water, I would open up my laptop and I would do, um, you know, a much more awkward maybe version of that to 10 people a day. And nine of them would say no. Nine of them would say, this isn't proven. Uh, I don't like your background. Uh, you know, what gives you the right to think that, you know, you can raise money for people in Southeast Asia or India or Africa. But then one person would say yes and would write a small check. And I would kind of hang on to that yes and stay positive and stay optimistic. Uh, so I think it's about, you know, you know, if you really believe in your vision, the integrity of what you're doing, the importance of what you're doing, um, you can often overcome some of the, the skeptics and the cynics um, with, with enthusiasm. And, and you know, now 13 years later with, with confidence, you know, uh, we're, we're one of the kind of top 250 organizations just in the whole United States and the amount of money uh, we're able to raise. So it was a long, long road getting here. Um, but there's still people. They're like, no, I want to watch a little more. You know, get a little bigger. Do something a little different. Um, and then sometimes you just have to move on. You know, you have to, 
you have to encourage yourself and say, uh, this might be someone who just doesn't care about our cause and is never going to to care about our cause. Right. Yeah, it's incredible. We always hear from people that always say, oh, let me see if you're successful first before I do something, right? Um, and then yeah. <laughs> and then they always find something else anyways, even if you're you'd be able to come successful. Um, I'm glad that we could relate on that. And uh, we have one more question that we have time for uh, from our chat. Um, but you, uh, as you mentioned, you, you've helped already 11 million people, but it's actually only 170th, right, of yeah. the total work that your goal and your vision is. And yeah. I'm asking this question because a lot of times when it comes to people's finances, they also have that same sentiment, right? They, you know, or even like whether it's losing weight or saving money, you get started a little bit and then, but you don't see the results right away, right? Especially compared to your really big goal. Um, how do you celebrate what you've already accomplished, even if though, doesn't, ma doesn't matter how far it is from your big goal, but how do you celebrate the small wins, but also remember to keep fighting for your ultimate vision or your, your big dream at the end? Yeah, that, that's great. That's why I love that quote. Cause like, you know, you just, you do these small things and you keep doing them and you keep doing them because you know, you're right. And then one day you look back and say, wow, 11 million people, you know, that's, 500 Madison Square Gardens full of people. Uh, you know, that's more than New York City and the boroughs. Yeah. Um, but then we kind of go back to today. Okay, what is the task at hand today? You know, I was looking through um, some of your literature over the weekend and, you know, I just, I love some of the stuff that, that you have to say on, on debt. You know, paying down those small debts first. There's a sense of accomplishment. Well, I did it. And then you take that energy and then you go on to the big scary one, you know, that feels like maybe you could never pay that down. Um, and you celebrate those, those wins and those successes along the way. Um, that was something I had to, you know, experience myself when I started Charity Water. I, was, I came back $30,000 in debt and it, it seemed like the worst time to wow. start a charity. And I went on a payment plan and said, I'm not gonna let this get in the way of it. Mm -hmm. um, I was making nothing at the time. I lived on a closet floor. I, you know, I ate the version of ramen noodles. <laughs> And now, you know, 13 years in, you know, I, I get to speak around the world. And uh, my wife and I, we, we just, every time people give us money, we try to give it to others. I mean, we look at our, you know, our financial literacy or, or the, the income we're able to earn as a way that we can bless others. Um, someone said to me once about a nonprofit leader many years ago, and I, I love this. It was, uh, he'd been at it for a long time. He had a wife, he had kids. And this was a, a shared board member. And she said, every time the board gives him a raise, he just gives it away. And she was so <laughs> frustrated. You know, and I think uh, he was in a position where he was able to do that. He was able to take any increase in his life and pass it on to people who maybe needed it. So, you know, I, I, I think, you know, I think in terms of financial literacy, not maybe in terms of the, the big houses or the cars or the watches anymore, but how many water projects are my wife and I able to do? Right. You know, what does our family legacy of giving look like? So I applaud the, the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Um, so I actually do have to ask one more question. I watched oh. you, um, you know, I watched you answer this with somebody else and you talked about the importance of giving even when you're in the process, right? You might not be financially secure yeah. yet, but you know, why? And you already, maybe sometimes you feel like you're struggling yourself just with your already current expenses and with your situation, yeah. especially with COVID-19 like right now, but what's the importance of giving no matter what, uh, yet, like no matter what your socioeconomic yeah. status is? I think it's a muscle that needs to be worked out. It's like, you know, going to the gym. Uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people that say, well, maybe I, I'm going to wait to do that or I'm going to wait to get fit or get healthy because I don't have the time now. And, uh, you know, I think, I think you were talking about there's a very famous entrepreneur and we won't blow him up, but his life's ambition is to own the New York Jets. He wants to own this football team that has stunk for a long time and he wants to make them great. And, you know, th this was a driving ambition for him financially, building his company, putting away the money to buy a football team. And I remember saying to him, but you're missing out. You're missing out on all the good you can do in the world. That might take you three decades. That might take you four decades. You might, the owner might not even want to sell to you, right? And you could get involved in a bunch of organizations, ours and others. And this guy turned out to, to build dozens of wells, dozens of schools. He's young. He's in his uh, late 30s, early 40s now. And, you know, because of that approach, 
He now gets to live vicariously through his money at work in the world now. It's not going to stop him from owning the football team. And in fact, if anything, generous people attract wealth. They attract talent. Wow. Uh, being generous is one of the most attractive things that you can be. So I, I would argue that him sitting on the board of charities and, and bringing that into his business life uh, will, will pay off uh, you know, in, a, in a way that he might not even imagine as people just want to work with, with generous people. So yeah, I would say it's a muscle. Um, you know, we have, we have a monthly giving community called The Spring. It's probably the best way that people can help Charity Water. You could just go to thespring.com. And we have a lot of people who are giving $5 a month. Right. And that may not seem like, you know, so much uh, to a lot of people, but they get a couple people clean water every year. So just imagine that at the end of 12 months, two human beings go from dirty water to clean water. Now, you know, how would you even put a price on that? Uh, so, you know, I think it's just, it's, it's the act of giving, which, which we encourage. And uh, my, my favorite saying around this is the more you give, the more you give. You know, it's not awesome. the more you give, the more you get. It's the more you give, the more you want to give. Awesome. Oh, wow. What's the next opportunity I could find to take maybe even a very small amount of, of resource and bless somebody with that? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time, Scott. We look forward to hopefully partnering with you more because we know that financial education and financial literacy is highly you know, uh, impacted or uh, highly correlated with charitable giving as well. And so we promise Absolutely. to do our part to help more organizations like Charity Water. Thank you so much again. God bless you and thanks for listening, everyone. And now,